Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning and bringing us here together, Lord, to study your word. Lord, we're so thankful that you're with us this morning. You haven't left us. You will not forsake us, Lord. And as we open your word, we know that you have desired to speak to us this morning. So, Lord, I ask that against any distractions, they would just be taken from us, whether it's something externally or something internally, something that we've been um, worrying about or anxious about, Lord. I pray we would take those things and give them to you, Lord, and focus on what you have to say, what your Holy Spirit is teaching us this morning that you would fill me with your spirit to speak your words. Lord, and we ask that you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, Paul says, But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who was made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those for whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all, in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Throughout church history, there have been many that thought that they were doing the work of God. They thought that, hey, what I'm doing, this is what the Lord wants. But instead, they found out, or it was revealed, they were actually doing the work of the devil. We can actually even see this in Scripture, um, most n notably in the Pharisees when they're uh, persecuting Jesus. You know, we look at the Pharisees and say, well, they have a bad rap. They have a bad, you know, they're bad guys. But in reality, they really thought they were doing the work of the Lord. They thought the Lord would have been proud of what they were doing. Because there was this guy that is proclaiming to be God. And as the Pharisees, the, the keepers spiritually of the nation of Israel, it's up to them to try and correct anything that comes up. So they really thought they were doing the work of the Lord. We all know that they weren't. They were actually working against the Lord. And in our own lives, we can actually do the same thing if we're not careful. We can do these things in our lives that we deem is spiritual or holy or even the work of the Lord, but then we find out it's actually not. It's actually the opposite of what the Lord would have. So here in these verses, we can actually see that Paul gives his reason at the start here, verses 1 and 2, why he did not come to them as he mentioned earlier in chapter 1. If you remember uh, last week, they had accused him of being fickle. He said, you know, they said that when he said he was going to come, that he said yes, that he really meant no. That, you know, he was just kind of saying, yeah, I'll be there, but never had any intentions of being there. Well, here in verse 1 and 2, um, he, he gives his reason why he did not come. He was going to go there, but if he was going to go there, it was going to be a sorrowful visit because he would have to go there to correct the church. But what's interesting about Paul is he didn't want to just go there to lay down the hammer. He said, I wanted it to be a joyful one. And, and, and not only that, but he also wanted to be encouraged. He says it in verse 2. He says, for, for if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who was made sorrowful by me? He goes, I'm going to go there. And of course, if there's sin there, I'm going to have to correct it. But I also want to be encouraged. And I'm, it's probably not going to happen if I'm there laying down the law, laying down the hammer. You guys probably wouldn't be very fond of me. Paul could see that there would be some contentions that would arise. He could see that his visit actually might, even though he intends there to be peace, he could see that there might not be peace. It's a very wise thing, I think, that Paul does here because he realizes that even though he would have been right in coming to them and correcting them in that manner, he realizes it actually wouldn't have been a beneficial situation for anyone. And again, even Paul here is recognizing that hey, I could be doing the work of the Lord, but what is the true heart of the Lord? Is the true heart of the Lord to crush the weak? 
No, it actually says that the, a broken reed he will not break. That he won't put out a, 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 a flickering candle. And Paul recognizes this in the church. And so instead of going there and totally crushing them and destroying them and, and being the holy superhero that he is, he decides to relent and, and stay back and says, you know what? I want my, my visit to you to be a joyful one, to be a beneficial one, to be one where you know, it's not just going to be a fist fight spiritually. So instead of coming to them with sorrow, he writes, he writes this letter to them. That's what he says in verse 3, and I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all for in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. He realized it would be a much, a much softer rebuke if he wrote the letter than if he had confronted them face to face. And again, I, I think that's very wise of Paul. He didn't want them to be discouraged, but instead he wanted them to know how he loved them even though he was correcting them. Notice what he says in verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. It, it's interesting that many people nowadays who like to ridicule and call out others, especially online, uh, there's supposedly this whole quote-unquote ministry where these people call out false teachers and all these churches that are doing the wrong things and whatnot. They use Paul as an example for what they do. Uh, the people that I've seen that have defended this pseudo ministry have all quoted Paul. Well, Paul called out certain people by name. Like, you know, when Demas left him because he loved the world, he said Demas by name. And so I'm going to call out this pastor by name, even though I've never met him, never talked to him, never been to his church, only saw a two minute snippet of his sermon online. And so I'm going to make a full fledged 18 page paper on why he's a, the Antichrist. They always like to use Paul as their example for that. But the only difference is when Paul did it, what does he say here? He did it with many tears, out of much affliction and anguish of heart. I don't think many of those people can say that. I think many of those people, in fact, they enjoy doing that. They enjoy breaking a broken, crushing a broken reed. But Paul here, we, we see that he realizes that he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't just want to correct them because it's the right thing to do, but he wants to love them. Again, Paul, Paul has mentioned before that as an apostle, he really has every right to, to do what he do that. He has every right, since he's the father of this church, to come in there and totally lay down the law. He'd have all the, the backings of the laws of Christ to, to do it, except one, maybe. And that's the law of love. Paul told the Corinthians in his earlier letter, and what we have is 1 Corinthians. He told them that, though I speak with the tongues of angels, though I speak with all wisdom and all knowledge, if I have not love, I'm just a clanging cymbal, a sounding brass. What he was saying is, I, I could definitely tell you everything you need to know. I could unravel the scriptures like you've never seen it done before. I could give you wisdom and insight into your life, but if I have not love, it's pointless, it's worthless, it's useless. It's not just that, but it's annoying. <laughs> a clanging cymbal, a sounding brass. And so Paul's desire here is not to just correct them, but to love them. And then he goes on in verse 5, but if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. 
This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. If you remember in 1 Corinthians 5, one of the main reasons Paul wrote that letter to the Corinthians, there was someone in the church that was sleeping with their stepmom sleeping with their father's wife. And Paul encouraged the church to do something about it instead of letting it be known without any punishment. Apparently, this, was, this guy was sleeping with his stepmom and it was a known thing. It wasn't a secret. It wasn't something Paul just, you know, the Holy Spirit gave him some insight to, like, hey, you know, I got a word of knowledge about this. No, it was something that everyone knew. Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's what he does. And, you know, that, that's between him and the Lord. We're not going to mess with that. You know, we don't know why they let it happen. But they let it happen. So Paul actually encourages them. and says, give such a one like that, give them actually up to Satan. Don't continue to harbor them in the church. See, again, they, they probably thought they were doing the work of the Lord. by not doing anything about it. Well, you know, you know, Jesus would just want us to love and just love no matter what's going on. Just love him, man. But Paul says, no, you actually need to get rid of that person. Give them up to their own lust and flesh. You're not supposed to have that in the church. And it seems that they actually listened to Paul, surprisingly. <laughs> they listened to him and cast that man out from the church. But Paul shows here that that's not what the point of the punishment was. The point of the punishment wasn't separation. See, church discipline is a subject that I think churches either completely ignore or overemphasize. Most churches, I would actually say, probably ignore it. If you were to take a survey of how many churches actively practice church discipline, most churches don't, where there's, where there's reasons to practice church discipline. Thankfully, since I've been here, we haven't had to practice church discipline, um, although I know that there's people here, so at one day, that'll probably have to happen. But in instances where church discipline is required, most churches probably wouldn't do it. Why? Especially in our culture, it's just better to let them live their own life, just keep loving them, keep or, or how they see it, keep reaffirming the sin that they're doing. And I, I think most churches ignoring it, they, it's not that they ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, but they explain it away. They might say all the reasons why they won't. Well, you know, we just, um, we want to give them another chance because, you know, our God is the God of second chances, Amen. <laughs> And, and they love to, to kind of twist the, the love of the Lord around. But see, I, what I find interesting, especially in our culture, is we have no problem canceling someone for what they did years ago before they were saved. But when someone is actively living in sin and saying they're a believer, well, you know, that's okay with us. We just turn the other cheek. We just mind our own business. Then you have the other side, the ones who overemphasize it, and they're the ones who really look to control your life and everything that you do with the constant fear of excommunication. Right? The, most of these are a lot, are very, very much so cults, where they get you to be so invested in the church, where everything is about that church, and when I say the church, I mean that building, that they, they, they control you by saying, look, if you ever step out of line, you're out. Well, and, and probably from that church is where they receive money, where they receive support, maybe even housing. All, all these different things. And um, it, it's really sad that they use excommunication as like a, a tool really to discourage people. And not to discourage people from sinning, but just to have fear. And quite frankly, a lot of these churches go straight to excommunication when they do practice church discipline. It goes straight to excommunication. 
completely disregarding what Jesus says in Matthew 18. Jesus says that if your brother sins, you, what do you do first? You, by yourself, without anyone else, you go to him to confront him in his sin. And what's the point of that? So that he would repent and be reconciled. Then, Jesus says, if he doesn't listen to you, if he still you know, wants to say, I don't care, my life, leave me alone, then you bring in another brother and you both go to him and you, again, you're living in sin. You need to repent. The whole point is repentance, reconciliation. And then finally, if he still says, you know what, I just don't care, whatever, then you bring it to the church. And you get the church involved, the church leadership. And if at that point they still decide not to repent, then you excommunicate them. I mean, it's a, it's a whole process, and it's laid out clearly in Matthew 18. There's no getting around it. There's no, well, you know, this situation's unique because... No, it's you go to the, your brother first. The, the, the very last straw is getting kicked out of the church. And so Paul here says that it was sufficient to punish him in that manner. But they should not stop at that punishment. But they should forgive and comfort the man. As I mentioned before, there are many who like to use Paul as an example for them calling out other people or being harsh or being critics of people's ministries. Well, yes, Paul does call these people out by name, but uh, there's a couple caveats to that. Paul knew these people, first, first and foremost. He knew these people. With some of these people, he served alongside them. So th this isn't like this televangelist preacher you might see on, on TV that you have no access to, that you haven't taken any of the steps in Matthew 18 with. So instead, he just... No, Paul knew these people. And, and there were times when he encouraged, hey, keep away from these people. And he told Titus and Timothy, for those causing division, for those teaching in error, you know, stay away from them. But when it came to those people that were just in sin, his main goal was always restoration to God, not excommunication. Notice what he says in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, any trespass, any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a man such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted well what could they be tempted by well they could be tempted not to love they could be tempted to they could be tempted to do a lot to be angry the whole point of of church discipline is restoration not humiliation that's the whole point. That's why Jesus in Matthew 18 says, you first go by yourself secretly alone. Not secretly, but alone. You're not bringing you know, it up in front of everyone. You know, you're not bringing it to the prayer meeting saying, well, you know, I saw on Facebook the other day that, you know, brother or sister so-and-so is going through this. So we really need to pray for them is what we need to do. <laughs> no, you go to them first. The point of church, church discipline is restoration, not humiliation. And then I find something interesting about this because typically when you think of church discipline, you think, well, that's the pastors, that's the elders. Those are those in charge. But what does Paul say? He says, this punishment, verse 6, which was inflicted by the majority, so he's speaking of the church, is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to re reaffirm your love to him. Notice that it's the whole church that needs to be active in this. He doesn't say, you know, get the, the pastors and leaders to go and take care of this. No, he says, the whole church took part in this church discipline, and now the whole church needs to take part in something so important, which is reaffirming your love for him. The whole church needed to do it. 
Um, it was a, a when I was in California, um, we had a you know a greeting ministry at the door, and there was one fella um, who um, always greet always greeted, and he, and he came from a very uh, tough background before, you know, hood guy. Um, but now he is one of actually the pastors in the church. And, um, but, you know, you look at him, and you see he's still a little rough, I guess. <laughs> if you knew him, you, you, you knew uh, he was very, very kind-hearted. But I, I remember um, speaking to one guy who had come to the church, um, re- come back to the church recently. He used to come before I went, and then I, he started coming back, and he had fallen into sin and everything. And he said the moment that he walked into the door, which he was so reluctant to do, you know, after living kind of this life of sin, knowing it was sin, knowing he was wrong, right when he walked into the door, the person greeting him, instead of saying, man, where have you been? Like, what's been up with you? The first thing he said is like, brother, good to see you, man. And just gave him a big hug. He said, we're so glad you're here this morning. And, and I remember hearing that just being so blown away because I, I, me personally, I've been so guilty of doing that when someone's you know, been missing for a while. Hey, what, what's going on with you? What sin are you in right now? Tell me, you know, <laughs> what's happening? Instead of just reaffirming the love that we have for that person. And, he, and, and the, the guy said that, you know, I'm so, I needed that because I was beating myself up enough. The world was beating me up. The enemy was beating me up. What I needed was that love, that re- the affirmation of love. And again, that's the whole church that needs to do it. Not just the pastors and elders. It's the whole church. And so he tells them here, he goes, look, what you did was right. You, you got him out of the church, but that's not where it stops. You guys actually need to be active in showing your love towards him. Into forgiving him. Forgive and comfort him. Lest, notice, notice why, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. We probably all heard it, right? The reason I don't go to church is because they judge me. You know, I used to go to church and then, you know, I, I struggled and I had some sin and then the whole church turned on me and whatever it might be. We probably all heard that from someone once or twice in our lifetime. Maybe you yourself were part of that. And it's certainly not an excuse to not go to church. I always tell them that. That's not a good excuse, but I understand, and they're absolutely right in a lot of cases. The church has been known to be harsh. When again, the whole point is restoration, not humiliation. And so he continues on in verse 9. For to this end I also wrote, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices." Now, when Paul originally wrote to them in 1 Corinthians to put him out, he was actually doing it, he mentioned it here, to see if they would be obedient. There must have been some reluctance in Paul saying, you know, I'm, I, I need to tell them they need to put this guy out, but I, I don't really know if they're going to do it. <laughs> because I was writing you to test you to see if you'd be obedient in all things. And it says that they were. And it says, all right, well, since you were obedient in that, I hope that you'd be obedient in this same thing to restore him. Now, I think this section, these last few verses, this is the most important part of this whole situation. Paul says that they needed to forgive the man, in verse 11, so that Satan would not be able to take advantage of them. Very interesting. See, forgiveness is something that is lost in our culture. We, we see it nowadays with the quote-unquote cancel culture. We, we even see it when someone does do something completely wrong, out of line, out of touch, and they want to 
repent of it, and the person they offended won't take their, won't forgive them. I've, I've shared this story. It happened a few years ago where a woman um, was acting very rude to a, do- uh, a, a lady and her young daughter. And, you know, the whole thing obviously is caught on video. You know, hey, I can't believe you're acting this way. You know, my daughter's just trying to sell some Girl Scout cookies and you're completely berating us and all these things. And um, the woman was completely out of line to berate the, the woman and her daughter that way. Well, obviously, you know, gets thrown all over social media, gets put in the news. The lady wants to apologize. I, I can't speak if the lady was sincere or just the pressure of all the, the social pressure of it being everywhere got to her. But the lady wanted to apologize nonetheless. Um, but the sad thing was, is the mother, and her daughter was eight, nine years old, the mother said, we will not accept her apology. We won't let anyone apologize to us for what they did like that. And then she had her daughter sitting right next to her, teaching her daughter these things that if someone wrongs you and they want forgiveness, you don't give it to them. And again, I, I, I'm not sure if the lady was sincere, but the Bible doesn't say, check to make sure someone's sincere before you forgive them, does it? Amen. You know, I have kids and, and uh, when they wrong each other, you certainly see that. You know, one of them says, I'm sorry, well, you, you didn't really mean it. You're still supposed to forgive them. That's between them and the Lord if they didn't mean it. What's between you and the Lord is that you didn't forgive them. But see, our culture is so quid pro quo, right? You do something, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. I work in customer service a lot, and so I see that all the time. You know? Hey, I'm being nice to you, so you need to do something nice for me. Well, not necessarily. (laughs) You might be speaking to me nicely, but um, your actions show something else. Or that's outside of our policy. I just can't do that. (laughs) Or if someone's mean to you, right? If someone, if you're on the phone with a customer service agent and they start raising their voice, that gives you the green light to start raising your voice, right? Right? Everyone agrees. Like, oh yeah, well they raised their voice first, so I now get to raise my voice. If you're at a restaurant and the waiter or waitress doesn't give you the time of day, messes up your order, does a lot of things, that gives you every right just to, you know, shun them and completely berate them or write a bad review or even give them a horrible tip or no tip at all. Right? What does grace mean? Getting what you don't deserve. I had a friend um, who really shook me, rocked my world when he said this. Again, for someone who li- who's worked in customer service for so many years, he he said, and and then I don't, you know, some people I know wouldn't agree with this. That's okay, but the the heart of heart behind it's great. He said when he would go to a restaurant and a waiter or waitress would actually do a horrible job, he'd actually tip them more. And then he'd explain to them what grace is. He says, look, I, I know that, you know, you did a horrible job and, you know, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know if I offended you. I don't know if I, but guess what? You know what grace is? It's getting what you don't deserve. And so I'm, I'm giving you this tip, not because you did a good job, because I want to show you grace. And then he'd share the gospel with them. And you can, I, I'm not saying you have to do that if you don't do that, but I, I love the picture of that. Because again, we, when we love grace in our own lives. We love grace in a spiritual situation. But forgiveness and grace, you know, when it comes to other things, is just thrown out the window. But see, grace and forgiveness applies to our whole life. Not just spiritually, you know, a sin between you and the Lord or a sin between you and them. Uh, grace and forgiveness is, is something radical. Again, some of you hear me share that story about what my friend does, some waiters and waitresses. You're like, that's radical. I would never do that. Grace and forgiveness is radical. (laughs) It should never have been given to us in the first place. None of us have deserved grace or forgiveness. It's something that's not natural in us. 
but it's something that can only be found supernaturally through the Lord. In fact, Peter even had to understand this, and the disciples, right? He says, Jesus, if someone sins against us, say, you know, seven times, the same, the same thing. They steal my coat seven times, seven days in a row. And, and you know, I, ca- I catch them every time. After that seventh time, I, you know, I, I, I have to be able to, you know, not forgive them, right? Jesus says, no. Seventy times seven, which was, if you know the, some numerology in the scriptures, seven is a number of completeness, a, a sign of completeness. And so when he was saying 70 times seven, he wasn't saying 490 times, make sure you keep a list. He was saying there is no list. There is no number. You will always forgive. And again, for the, for the Christian, forgiveness is completely different even. I mean, uh, yes, our world does forgive, right? At times. There's always strings attached. But they, they do like to quote unquote forgive. But for the Christian, it's, it's different. In Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Even, he, what he's saying there is, don't just forgive because Christ forgave you. Forgive like Christ forgave you. And how did Christ forgive you? Completely. Our sins have been cast, far, uh, cast from us as far as the east is from the west. Our sins aren't even close to us anymore in, in what we're labeled as. No, we're labeled as righteous. So just as Christ forgave you, you now go out and forgive others. Not, hey, I'll forgive you if you promise not to do it again. Hey, I'll forgive you if you're sincere in your sorry. Hey, I'll forgive you, but you know, you're going to have to work back your trust with me, mister. I'll forgive you, but I won't forget it. Our sins are no longer held against us. What Paul says here is that if you don't do that, anything else besides that kind of radical forgiveness, you're playing into the hands of the devil in his schemes, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. See, the enemy loves to bring division in the church because he knows that he cannot beat the church externally. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Satan knows that. And so since the beginning, he's been trying to destroy it from within. That's how he's loved to operate. I'm not worried about outside persecution. I'm not worried about them shutting down churches and doing all that. That doesn't change anything. What I'm worried about is division inside the church. People inside the church not forgiving, not loving, not submitting, not serving. That's how Satan really wins. Not by, you know, a Democrat-run president or a Democrat-run Senate. No, he wins by Christians giving up and destroying each other. So in closing this morning, what does this all mean for us today? Again, I'm not going to bring anyone up here and say, all right, church, we're going to cast this person out, and I want you guys to practice forgiveness to that person. We're not going to do that. Unless anyone wants to volunteer. No. (laughs) If you're hurting this morning because you have sinned and you think the Lord or the church does not want you, then realize that God wants reconciliation with you. His plan and desire for you is to be with Him and to walk with Him. Anything that you hear that would keep you from the Word, that would keep you from prayer, that would keep you from the church, is not from the Lord. That's from the enemy. And, and we can get those confused so many, so many times we think when we sin and we hear that, don't go to church tomorrow. We think that's the Lord telling us that. Yeah, well, you know, the Lord doesn't want me there. Or I can't read my Bible this morning because of what I did last night. The Lord's not going to want to speak to me. What is the Lord, some like 14-year-old teenager that like is giving you the silent treatment? No. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Even when we're faithless, He is faithful. 
Anything that would keep you from the things of the Lord is the enemy. Anything that pushes you to the Lord is obviously the Lord. That, that when you sin and you feel convicted and all you want to do is pray, that's the Lord. And then that other voice that kind of tells you, you know, now you need to wait at least 24 hours before you pray again. The Lord's still a little hot right now with you. No, but the Lord desires reconciliation with you. He desires restoration. Don't fall into the schemes of the devil. Maybe this morning you need to forgive someone. Maybe you haven't been giving the forgiveness of the Lord. Maybe, you, you, again, you've forgiven, but you haven't forgotten. Maybe you've forgiven at a distance. You've been sitting with bitterness in your heart and you're playing right into the trap of the devil. You, you think you're doing the work of the Lord. I'm going to show them by, you know, not talking to them. I'll wait for them to call me. I'll wait for this. I'll wait for that. And you think you're doing the work of the Lord. There's only one way someone can be convicted. And it's not by the finger of man. It's by the Spirit of God. It's not up to us to force someone into forgiveness. It's not up to us. No, that's why he says to the church here, do all that you can do to reaffirm your love to him. Paul must have either someone had told him or he understood but he, this guy is falling into great sorrow and you guys need to do all that you can do to reach out to him as Paul will mention later on that because we have been reconciled with God he's now given us that ministry of reconciliation where we need to go out and reconcile not just others to God which is the great commission but amongst ourselves reconcile We need to be people of reconciliation. And do you know what that word reconcile means? It doesn't just mean that like you've forgiven them and you kind of allowed them back in your life. Reconciliation means that you are back to the point where you left off. Right? So they were your best friend and they stabbed you in the back. Reconciliation says that you bring them back, not that you know, you're not my friend anymore. I've forgiven you, but we just can't, this isn't going to work. We can't be friends anymore. And when God reconciled us to him, he brought us back to where we were in the garden, walking with him, unashamed, because now we're seen as holy, as righteous. He didn't say, you know, all those sins. You, I for, I've forgiven you, but it's gonna take a, it's gonna take a while. That's why Paul says to the Galatians, "What's begun in the spirit cannot be made perfect in the flesh." Sometimes we think that God saved us, and now from our point of saving to when we die or when He comes back, it's up to us to prove that we earn, we deserve forgiveness. <laughs> no, you have not deserved forgiveness, and you never will. And you know what? That person that you need to forgive, they don't deserve forgiveness. But neither did you when Christ forgave you. And he tells you, you need to forgive them. See, we are the people of God and we need to act like him even as we forgive. Because if we don't forgive, then we're actually doing the work of Satan. We're building his kingdom. We're adding to his kingdom. But when we forgive, we're doing the work of God. So Lord, we thank you first and foremost for your forgiveness. Without it, none of us would be here this morning. None of us deserved it. Maybe even some of us weren't completely sincere when we asked for it. (laughs) Lord, but through your work of your spirit, Lord, you have saved us. You have given us grace, that which we don't deserve. You've given us mercy, not getting what we do deserve. And so, Lord, as your people, it only makes sense that we do what you've done for us, that we love, that we forgive, that we show grace, that we show mercy.
Lord, and even that we would speak the truth. We, we know the situation we read about this morning all had to do with someone's sin and it was addressed. Lord, if there's sin in, in our life, let us address it. If there's someone in our life who is living in sin, let us follow the principles you've given us in Matthew 18 to go to them with the whole purpose of restoration, Lord. That's your desire is that all would be saved, that they would be restored, not humiliated. So, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just have love, but we would have truth. And we wouldn't just have truth, that we would have love. So, Lord, I pray that you would work in our lives. I pray for anyone discouraged right now by the enemy. Lord, by your spirit, you would encourage them. That other believers would reaffirm their love for them. As you do for us all the time. We lift all these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand for this last song?